Oxford Union. This is, is this the one? Ah. Right, here we go. Madam President, <clears throat> and gentlemen, ladies of the house, I, standing here with eight minutes uh, in my classes and, uh, and venerable and rather magnificent institution, I was going to assure you that I belong to the Henry VIII School of Public Speaking. That as Henry VIII said to his wives, I shall not keep you long. <laughs> but now ah, finding thanks. myself... Yeah, good one. <laughs> but now finding myself the seventh speaker out of eight in what must already seem a rather long evening to you, I rather feel like Henry VIII's last wife. I more or less know She's on what's the spot, expected though, of me, she? but I'm not sure how to do it any differently. <laughs> you know, perhaps what I should do is really try and pay attention to the arguments that were advanced by the opposition today. We had, for example, Sir Richard Ottaway suggesting, uh, challenging the very idea that it could be argued that the economic situation of the colonies was actually worsened by the experience of British colonialism. Well, I stand to offer you the Indian example, Sir Richard. India's share of the world economy when Britain arrived on its shores was 23%. By the time the British left, it was down to below 4%. Why? Simply because That's India had been shocking. governed for the benefit of Britain. How did they and have those Britain's records? Britain's rise in 200 years was financed by its depredations in India. In fact, Britain's Industrial Revolution the thing is, how will we ever know what to compare it to? Because he doesn't know what would have happened if we didn't. The handloom Colonial. weavers, for example, famed across the world, whose products were exported around the world. Questions, Britain there? came right in. There were actually these weavers making fine muslin, light as woven air, it was said. And Britain came right in, smashed their thumbs, broke their looms, imposed tariffs and duties on their cloth and products, and started, of course, uh, taking the raw materials from India and shipping back manufactured cloth flooding the world's markets with what became the products of the dark and satanic mills of Victorian England. That uh, meant that the weavers in India Didn't became beggars, and India went from being a world-famous exporter of finished cloth into an importer, went from having 27% of world trade to, to less than 2%. Meanwhile, colonialists like Robert Clive you don't get taught any of this. Rotten like, in England on the no one ever mentions it when you're growing India. up. <laughs> while taking the Hindi word loot into their dictionaries as well as their habits. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Very true. Cool. And the British had the gall to call him Clive of India as if he belonged to the country when all he really did was to ensure that much of the country belonged to him. <laughs> Fair point. By the end of the 19th century, the fact is that India was already Britain's biggest cash cow, the world's biggest purchaser of British goods and exports, and the source of highly paid employment for British civil servants. We literally paid for our own oppression. Mm -hmm. And as has been pointed out, the wealthy Victorian British families that made their money out of, out of the slave economy. We don't One help ourselves, do we, <laughs> as a country? <laughs> of the wealthy class in Britain in the 19th century owed their money to transporting three million Africans across the waters. Yeah. And in fact, in 1833, when slavery was abolished, what happened was that a compensation of 20 million pounds was paid, not as reparations to those who had lost their lives or, or who had suffered or been oppressed by slavery, but to those who had lost their property. I was struck by the fact that Blimey. the Wi-Fi password of this union commemorates the name of Mr. Gladstone, the great liberal hero. Just well, told sorry, everyone the password. <laughs> <laughs> everyone in the audience there is like, oh, yes. check my email. Really on. <laughs> Staying with India, between 15 and 29 million Indians died of starvation in British-induced famines. The most famous example, of course, was the Great Bengal Famine during the Second World War, when four million people died because Winston Churchill deliberately, as a matter of written minuted policy, proceeded to divert essential supplies from civilians in Bengal to sturdy Tommies and Europeans uh, as reserve stockpiles. Yeah. He said that the starvation of any way underfed Bengalis mattered much less than that of sturdy Greeks. This is Churchill's actual quote. And when conscious stricken British officials wrote to him, pointing out that people were dying because of this, of this decision, that is such a lot of he peevishly wrote in the margins mm. of the file, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? So all notions that the British 
Everyone likes Winston Churchill, but he was actually a bit of a dick. To try and bring the benefits like loads of, of things of he did. But just because he won the World War II. He won the World War II for us, didn't he? Well, he died to speak German. <laughs> but with big sacrifices. Yeah. Even lie to this myth. As others have said and on the proposition, violence and racism were the reality of the colonial experience. And no wonder that the sun never sat set on the British Empire because even God couldn't trust the English in the dark. Oh no, he didn't! <laughs> I don't like it when they try and put in like cheap dope jokes. The yeah, first speaker, Mr. Lee, suggested know. these things couldn't be quantified. Well, let me quantify World War Probably I for you. Again, I'm sorry, from an insane. Indian perspective, others have spoken of other countries. One sixth of all the British forces that fought on the war were Indian. 54,000 Indians actually lost their lives in that war. 65,000 were wounded, another 4,000 remained missing or in prison. Indian taxpayers had to cough up a hundred million pounds in that time's money. money. India <laughs> supplied 70 million rounds of ammunition, 600,000 rifles and machine guns, 42 million garments were stitched and sent out of India, and 1.3 million Indian personnel served in this war. I know all this because, of course, the, the, the commemoration of the centenary has just taken place. But not just that, India had to supply 173,000 animals, 370 million tons of supplies, Gosh. and in the end, the total value of everything that was taken out of India. India and India, by the way, suffering from recession at that time and poverty and hunger was in today's money, eight billion pounds. You want quantification? It's available. Second World War. <laughs> it's shot, isn't it? it is unbelievable. It was even worse. Two and a half million. Like, like you say, you don't form. actually ever I know. The points, yeah. But like all the Britain's stuff we do about World War One and World War Two. In 1945, I think it was maybe like a footnote. Was owed to India and never actually paid. Somebody mentioned Scotland. Well, fact is that colonialism actually cemented your union with Scotland. You know, the Scots had actually tried to send colonies out uh, before 1707. They'd all failed, I'm sorry to say. But then, of course, came Union, and India was available, and there you had a disproportionate employment of Scots. I'm sorry, Mr. Mackenzie has to speak after me. Engaged in the... <laughs> he <laughs> did the impressed the one. <laughs> soldiers, as merchants, as agents, as employees, sorry, Mr. and the earnings from India is what brought prosperity to Scotland, even pulled pull Scotland out of poverty. Now Fair that India's no longer there. These things you never realise and never learn about any kind of school teaching, do you? But um, now we've heard down some for a moment. On this side, there's been a, a mention of the railways. Well, let me tell you, first of all, as my colleague, the Jamaican High Commissioner, has pointed out, uh, railways and roads were really built to serve British interests and not those of the local people. But I might add that many countries have been Who uses those roads, roads now? We don't use the roads, do we? They use the roads. So. They're benefiting them now. I have quite a few opinions of them. They were designed to carry raw materials from the hinterland into the ports to be shipped to Britain. And the fact is that the Indian or Jamaican or other colonial public, their needs were incidental. Transportation, there was no attempt made to match supply to demand for mass transport, none whatsoever. Instead, in fact, the Indian railways were built with massive incentives offered by Britain to British investors guaranteed out of Indian taxes paid by Indians, with the result that you actually had one mile of Indian mm -hmm. railway costing twice what it cost to build the same mile in Canada or Australia because there was so much money being paid in extravagant returns. Britain made all the profits, controlled the technology, supplied all the equipment, and absolutely all these benefits came as private enterprise, British private enterprise, at public risk, Indian public risk. That Gosh. was the, the, the railways as an accomplishment. We're hearing about aid. I think it was, uh, it was, it was again, Sir Richard Otto, who mentioned uh, uh, British aid to India. Well, let me just point out that British aid to India is about 0.4% of India's GDP. The government of India actually spends more on fertilizer subsidies, which might be an appropriate metaphor for that argument. <laughs> if I may point out as well, He's brilliant. He's got such a way with words, isn't he? It certainly gets his point across. Let me point out as well that, um, that as my fellow speakers from the proposition have pointed out, there have been incidents of racial violence, of loot, of massacres, of bloodshed 
of transportation, in India's case, even of one of our, our last Mughal emperor. Yes, maybe today's Britons are not responsible for some of these depredations, but the same speakers have pointed with pride to their foreign aid. You're not responsible for the people starving in Somalia, but you give them aid. Surely the principle of reparations for what is for the wrongs that have been done cannot be denied. It's been pointed out, for example, that afford... the <laughs> you know what I mean? Africans and we the couldn't Caribbean, afford to pay reparations because no. it would be so much. <laughs> the undermining of social traditions, of property rights, of, of the authority structures of these societies, all in the interests of, of, of British colonialism. Gosh. And the fact remains that many of today's problems in these countries, including the persistence, in some cases, the creation of racial and ethnic and religious tensions, were the direct result of the colonial experience. So there is a moral debt that needs to be paid. Someone challenged uh, reparations elsewhere. Well, I'm sorry, Germany doesn't just give reparations to Israel. It also gave reparations to Poland. Perhaps some of the speakers here are too young to remember the dramatic picture of Chancellor Willy Brandt on his knees in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1970. And there are other examples. There is uh, Italy's reparations to Libya. There's Japan's to Korea. But even Britain has paid reparations to the New Zealand <laughs> Maoris. So it's not as if this is something unprecedented or unheard of that's going to somehow open some sort of nasty Pandora's box. No wonder Professor Lewis reminded us that he's from Texas. There's a wonderful expression in Texas that summarizes the arguments of the opposition. All hat and no cattle. <laughs> now, he knows his stuff, doesn't he? Quickly look through the other notes I was Very good about. speaker. There was Very good. Democracy and rule of law. Let me say with the greatest possible respect. This is what I hate about like can, it's a bit rich business meetings and stuff and people kill, laugh at lame jokes. Like, for but they overcompensate their laugh and laugh really loudly. Which is a good thing, it's not even that funny. You've got to listen so carefully though, because the speed that he speaks blown away by how intelligent he is. Democracy, sir. We had to snatch it, seize it from you. With the greatest of reluctance, it was conceded in India's case after 150 years of British rule, and that too with limited franchise. Yes, indeed, ma'am. The opposition spoke quite highly of Greek and Athenian democracy on which the West should pride itself, and spoke of liberty and equality in that same name. The Athenian democracy was only functioning because of the slave society on which it was built. That's the nature all right, I don't think that needs, uh, needs mm. contradiction, not for me at any rate. <laughs> but, oh, she's but egg, she? just, yeah, how did she get involved? Just I think the argument point of interest? The, speaker, the first speaker, Mr. Lee in particular, conceded all the evil atrocities of colonialism, but essentially suggested that reparations no, 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 no. won't really help, they won't help the right people, they'll be used as a propaganda tool, they'll embolden people like Mr. Mugabe. It's always nice how in the old days, you know, uh, I'm sorry to say that, uh, the, the people of the Caribbean used to frighten their children into behaving and sleeping by saying Sir Francis Drake would come after them. That was a legacy of that. Of that. Now, now it's Mugabe will be there. So this is the, the new sort of Sir Francis Drake of our times. The fact is, the fact is very simply, sir, that we are not talking about reparations as a tool to empower anybody. They're a tool for you to atone for the wrongs that have been done. And I, Fair enough. We should do more for India. I am we really should. quite prepared to accept the proposition that you can't Personally, evaluate, I think. put, a, put a, a monetary sum on the kinds of horrors people have suffered. Certainly no amount of money can expiate the loss of a loved one, as, as somebody pointed out there. Uh, you're not going to be able to figure out an exact amount. But the principle how much, is someone killed me, how much money the would you want from them to make up for it? Lively, <laughs> sacrifices on both sides. As a, a, I'd probably pay them. <laughs> burglar comes into your house, ransacks the place, stubs his toe, and you say, well, he, there was a sacrifice on both sides. That, I'm sorry to say, is not an acceptable, is not an acceptable argument. Um, the truth is that um, we are not arguing specifically that vast sums of money need to be paid. The proposition before this house is the principle of owing reparations, not the fine points of how much is owed, to whom it should be paid. The question is, is there a debt? Does Britain owe reparations? As far as I'm concerned, the ability to acknowledge a wrong that has been done, to simply say sorry, will go a far, far, far longer way than some percentage of GDP 
in, 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 form, in the form of, of, of aid. I what agree. is required, it seems to me, is accepting the principle that reparations are owed. Personally, I'd be quite happy if it was one pound a year for the next 200 years after the last 200 years of Britain quid. in India. Thank you very much, Madam President. Very good. What do you think? Obviously, naturally, I'm going to protect Britain because that's my motherland. That's where I'm from. That's my culture. Um, but I feel like, you know, the saying like just picking at the scabs. Like, we okay, put hands up. We made a mistake. I'm a great believer in if you've done something wrong, you admit to it, build a bridge, get over it. But I feel like okay, we made a mistake. Why are you still picking at what happened hundreds of years ago? Like, all of those people are dead. Like. People that Winston Churchill, he's gone. Like that's not our fault. Don't keep holding us against that. We send, we do, like you mentioned, we send foreign aid out and stuff. But okay, fair enough. The English, like our government, should apologise and all that shiz. But why? Don't hold that against us now. We, I, I agree. It was terrible, like starving the Indians when we were just having the food for backup. That's dreadful. That shouldn't have happened. But please don't hold that against us now. We're completely new. That's it's unfair. Wow, what a history lesson that was. I learned so much from that video. So thank you for um, letting me watch that. That that was uh, really educational. Uh, there were lots that I didn't know. Um, and wow, we did some bad stuff. Um, and I just was not aware of all that. And of course, we, in our schools in the UK, we are not taught that sort of stuff. We're taught about what we did right, not what we did wrong. I have so much more respect for the Indian people now that I've watched that because, you know, it could have been horribly, gone horribly wrong, our relationships with India, so, you know, it's a good thing. I don't really know too much about it. You don't really get taught this sort of stuff in school. You can't help when like someone is speaking badly of your, like of where you come from. You kind of feel a little bit defensive. But like he's not having a go at British people. He's having a go at colonialism. Yeah, it was interesting. Like uh, he, you can tell he's very peeved. Our generation now and our government now and in this like time now we've got more important things to worry about than what a country may have done 200 years ago. What we did was awful and things to India, but as Misha said, our generation and this, we haven't done anything wrong and we shouldn't be owing money for that. He's very well spoken, put his point across brilliantly. The fact that he wasn't asking for kind of any monetary amount, um, I think was fair play to him to be fair. Brought in a fair, like a lot of good points as well about what the British Empire did and how India suffered within the wars, World War One, World War Two. I thought we were talking about World War Two to start off with, so uh, it's shocking to hear how much they put in for World War One as well as. Should we, as modern-day British civilians, feel ashamed of our ancestors' involvement in India? I don't think we should feel ashamed because that's not my fault. I sh you should feel ashamed for things you do wrong and that are unacceptable. But we should most definitely be knowledgeable of it. I obviously we took history lessons, but they blink you on what infant, what history they want you to learn about. Obviously World War Two, when we won, obviously they're going to want to brag about that. But um, yeah, we should definitely be more knowledgeable, but not necessarily feel ashamed because I don't feel it's our wrongdoing in this day and age. I don't think ashamed is the right word. I don't think you can be ashamed for something you had no control over and no part in. But I think we have to make sure we teach the generations today of what happened. Not even just ourselves, but the whole world should know what's happened everywhere. Yeah, I definitely don't think that um, we should be ashamed of it. I, I think a lot of our ancestors, especially like modern day people like me and you and like low, low caste citizens or whatever, shouldn't be ashamed because a lot of our families died and a lot of people died over here and made sacrifices over here as well, so. I don't think we should feel ashamed. Um, I personally don't feel ashamed for what's been done, but I do believe that we can move forwards as together and make and make it make it better for everyone, like across the whole world. I mean, it's not just India that we've we've caused violence to; it's Ireland and everyone else. Every kind of uh, association we've had, except for America, has um, has been with the heel of our boots. So I don't I don't necessarily feel ashamed, but I feel there's a lot that I could do to 
help better things. That's got nothing to do with us, so how could we have ever stopped that? Not anything we've like ever done, like it began like 200 years ago and if we felt bad <coughs> for everything our ancestors done then like we'd feel ashamed of like some sort of grandparents done like we can't really live like that, we've mm. got our own things to do, our own people, so. You've got to be careful with the word ashamed um, because lots of people have or would have different definitions of the word ashamed. How do you, um, like you say, how do you owe repents to um, uh, India? And um, I don't think that um, it should be a certain value attached to it. I think it's just a case of the British people knowing at least what we did to India for us to say, that we're sorry about what we did. Why hasn't the British government acknowledged these atrocities and formally apologised? Well, it's kind of like, to me, I think, oh, it's in the past, so so there's a lot of things going on in the world at the minute that take, draws their attention from it. And I don't, I think this sort of apology needs to come right from the top. I think it's probably because it's committing political suicide. And from a selfish point of view from the party, they are showing a weakness and then that party and that Prime Minister will be associated with what happened in the past. So from a purely selfish respect, I think that's why they don't do it. Also, it's just maybe a little bit embarrassing that no one's ever said sorry properly kind of thing, or like... Gone on too long now. It's it? gone on too long. Probably because they're embarrassed, and it'll probably make them look, I wouldn't say vulnerable, but as if they've done something wrong. They want to feel like they're the big boys. They, they always, what they do is the right decision. What they do is, is the right thing for everyone. But sometimes shit happens and it, and it isn't the right thing. But uh, yeah, I think it was because, not admitting defeat, but that sort of vibe. And they don't want to. They want to feel like, oh yeah, that was us. We did that. Don't know. I mean, have we ever said sorry? Well, I don't know why we haven't. Um, I just find it really really bizarre how this whole issue is almost swept under the carpet you know and forgotten about and so i just find it really really odd the whole concept of what we did to india is almost forgotten about and um we don't say sorry uh, you know people like myself didn't know that all this happened and so it's been a real educational lesson to me I suppose because they don't really care. Um, much more uh, interested in their own self-belonging. Probably because they don't think they've actually done anything wrong. I didn't even know about it until we watched a video about it a few months ago. So they're probably thinking, oh, maybe if we just don't <coughs> bring it up, then, you know, we can just keep it quiet and not have to mention it. Probably through embarrassment, really. They don't like admitting that they do things wrong and things, but I think that's bad. They should acknowledge what they've done and um, say sorry. Should the Italians apologise to the UK for the Roman Empire? Well that's difficult because the Roman Empire was a uh, thousand years ago. It was a long long time ago. Like everything's changed since then. Countries, borders and all of that. Whereas India, the state India is in now is because of the British. They cut up in, in India into the way it is and they're still recovering from that. There's still people alive that were involved in, well, that can remember that or can remember the aftermath of that. I think there is something, with time, things, you do leave them, but India is fairly recent in, the British colonisation of India is fairly recent in terms of the world. We're not really exactly spinning about it because we've moved on from that. We were like, oh yeah, that happened. Let's move on. Let's do something new. It's such a competition, isn't it? God. Why can't I just beg a cake and be happy? <laughs> no, because we love the Romans. Built Hadrian rules to stop out the picks. Gave us roads, Roman baths. I mean, they brought in a lot of scientific goodness for people that were kind of woodland savages, shall we put it. If you spin it round that way, then no, because it's in the past. So I'm not expecting an apology. Um, probably because I didn't know about it, you know, and that's another lesson that I wasn't taught at school. Um, can I just say I wasn't very good at history? I think you've already guessed that. And just 
people appreciating what has happened in the past and at least being educated and now knowing about it, I think that's all that's needed. I don't personally feel like they should, they owe us any apology or anything because it was so many years ago, things, everyone looks at things different and things. I don't really care, to be honest. <laughs> they can if they want to, they don't have to, it doesn't really bother me. Finally, does Britain owe reparations to its colonies? I don't feel like we should like repay them but we should definitely help them and assist them in building their economy as strong as ours is. Certain countries they have their own government they're responsible for that why should we feel like we have to do that but we should definitely if there's anything that we can do to help or assist but not necessarily just pay for and do it for them help them and there's like the saying like give a man a fish you'll feed him for a day teach a man to fish and you'll feed him for a lifetime so I think if we can help them to do it for themselves then they'll be much more successful. I, I don't think so no at the end of the day, it happened a long time ago. I know that obviously they're in a, in a real state now, but again, it's probably like the closed mindlessness of the saying that it doesn't really affect like me, it doesn't really affect my, my country. So, um, to me, the world we live in now is definitely a dog eat dog world, and the, fit, the fittest and strongest survive in my eyes. I think it's a difficult one because I don't think the money it will do much to repair what was changed, like it's history, so it's happened. Um, we've all moved forward. Every country has its own different struggle now. So like, I think maybe the apology thing, like um, that makes sense to do that. That's something we can do, but I don't think, we, one, we couldn't afford to pay reparations to everyone, I don't think. And two, I don't think it's gonna really benefit anyone. I, th I think Britain owes so much to everyone that's, uh, that we've ever caused harm to. Um, I suppose the one thing that when reparations were given and um, you talk about the wars and things like that, World War One, well World War Two was started because Germany couldn't pay the reparations and then mount that force, so no, but I don't think we should pay reparations but I think we should formally acknowledge what we have done in the past, which is exactly what um, what he was saying on there. No, I don't think so. They don't owe them any money for what they've done, it's bad. The things that's done is really bad and things, but money's not going to solve people's hurt and grief from what was caused. I think at the time they could have done, and like after it happened, but not like, what, a couple of hundred years after it happened. It's just a bit like, you know, let it go. If I was an Indian, then I would be expecting either Theresa May or even the Queen of um, the UK really going to India on like a big tour, lots of people know about it, and giving one big speech to say, look, what happened in the past, and doing almost like the doctor said, you know, uh, going over there and, and saying sorry.